Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Tosca Lindberg. I'm a food addict and I am a food addiction coach with Shift Recovery. Uh, welcome to this exciting webinar, Breaking the Chains of Food Addiction, a frontline perspective on food addiction treatment. I'm so excited to share this topic with you all. We have tonight with us two of the world's leading experts in food addiction, Dr. Vera Tarman and Amanda Leith of Shift Recovery. These two make an amazing team. They really complement one another's strengths. And tonight we are going to benefit from the years of experience they have, both with the medical knowledge and their experience on the front lines of food addiction treatment. This is our second webinar featuring Dr. Tarman and Amanda. If you didn't catch the first one, it was amazing. It's available on our YouTube channel, and I will share the link to it as well as other important links in both the chat and in our follow-up email. So this event is being recorded, and the link will be available afterwards on the SHIFT Facebook page and on our website. It'll also be emailed to you directly if you registered for this event uh, on our webpage or if you are subscribed for our emails at foodaddiction.com. Now, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Vera Tarman and Amanda Leith. Let me give you a bit of background on each of them. Dr. Vera Tarman is an addictions physician with a special interest in sugar and food addiction. She's the author of the book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. She's the co-host of the weekly Food Junkies podcast, and she moderates a free thriving Facebook group called I'm Sweet Enough, Sugar Free for Life. She is herself in recovery from food addiction and has maintained a 100 pound weight loss for 15 years. Amanda Leith is a certified food addiction counselor and the director of Shift Recovery by Acorn, a company that has been providing in-person treatment for food addiction for over 30 years now. Amanda has a background in drug and alcohol counseling and group facilitation. She sits on the board of directors for the Food Addiction Institute she is also a recovering food addict, maintaining 130 pound weight loss for the past nine years. Both of these women have extensive experience with the treatment of food addiction, and they are here to share their expertise and guidance and what they have experienced that actually works both with their clients and in their personal lives. So our format for tonight's webinar is going to be uh, more of a discussion than, than a presentation. I have four PowerPoint slides that I'll be sharing that are going to highlight some key ideas, and Dr. Tarman and Amanda will share their knowledge and expertise as we go. I have some questions for them to ask my own questions, and you guys can feel free to type any questions you have into the chat. Um, we will spend about 15 minutes on each slide and see where the discussion takes us. So with that, let's jump right into it. I'm gonna share my screen and um, our first slide is, let's see. Our first slide is one of the most powerful slides that we have according to Amanda that we use at Shift. And I'm gonna let Amanda uh, share the meaning of the slide and then we'll see where the discussion takes us. So take it away, Amanda. Oh, thanks Tosca. Great introduction, hi everyone. Glad you're all here with Dr. Vera and I tonight. Um, so this um, is what we refer to um, in the shift community as the roundabout. And, you know, we kind of call it, this is the dilemma that every addict faces, uh, what this slide is representing. It's the dilemma. And it's um, addiction. Uh, the disease model of addiction is that there's two components to it. There's a physical component and the mental component. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand side of your screen, it says the physical component. And what this means, you can see up here on the mouth that when we ingest um, any substance that we're addicted to, um, so tonight we're talking about food, we're, we're talking about mainly sugar, um, ultra processed food, could be volume, could be many different things. When we ingest, ingest that, if we're addicted, 
um, and we ingest something that we're addicted to, we have an abnormal reaction. And I'll let Dr. Vera kind of talk more about the science of that. I'll just, I'll just run through this first. So we have an abnormal reaction, which kicks off a physical craving. And then we start eating um, or um, binging or purging or restricting. And we've kind of lost control, not kind of, we have lost control. And then as you go down here, oh yeah, it's, I'm trying to control it over here. I, I don't have control. As we go down here to the national anthem, that's when for, for me, I certainly know the countless times before I got proper treatment, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm going on this diet on Monday. I'm never going to eat like that again. Um, you know, I'm going to follow this exercise plan. That was kind of the day I just held up my hands and I said, okay, it's over. I'm no longer doing this again. Okay. And then I go along. I'm no longer doing it again. So I've stopped ingesting the physical substance. And then down at the bottom, life happens. Life happens. We live in this world. Amazing things happen. Really, really hard, painful things happen. We get filled with all sorts of feelings, both joy, happy, scared, sad, anger. Um, and then we move over into the right-hand side of your screen under the mental part of the disease. And all these emotions get logged into our emotional barometer. They get logged into inside of us. And for a while, you can see where the barometer is green. Our willpower is strong enough to deal with the emotions. Um, and then as we get fuller and fuller of emotions, and I'm talking about good, good emotions, bad emotions. We'll talk more specifically about that later. We fill up and we fill up and we fill up. Until we hit what we call at the very top there, the boiling point. And at that point, when we hit the boiling point, we have a mental obsession. And a mental obsession is a thought that is stronger than any other thought we have. And this is why, um, you know, no matter what our consequences are, what we've what we say we're never going to do again, all of a sudden, we're picking up the food again as our solution. We're always looking for a, a solution to make us feel better. And food is a solution for many of us. It's just not one we can sustain. And then we're back. As soon as we pick up the food again, then we're back going down the left side. And I'll just say one other thing is that you see on the physical side, you have an abnormal reaction bang or a normal reaction click. Uh, what that means, and that's where the little gun in there is, um, is that there are days when we pick up our addictive substances and it does, doesn't lead us straight into a full-on binge. We can just have one. We can have one cookie and we're okay. Um, we're always picking up thinking that day is going to happen. Um, but the deal is, even if it's a day that we call a click day, meaning there was there was um, no bullet in the gun, so we were okay, we still go down to the bottom and life happens and our emotional barometer picks up and then we eat again. And we never know, is it going to be a bang day where we're face down in the binge? Or is it going to be a normal reaction, if you will, and not go into the physical craving? Vera, do you want to talk a little bit about what's happening in that physical craving? And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. I like that. I I I actually never heard of that term that a click day and a bang day. It's good. Um. And the first thing that I that struck me about this slide was the big yellow bold disease concept of addiction. And you know what we're talking about here is that the the normal person, um, the normal brain, the whatever normal means, because I actually don't think there's many of us who are not addicted somewhere in life to something. But anyway, the the, the idea is. Maybe the uh, naive brain or the original brain would everything would be a click um, because we are meant to uh, enjoy foods and that's not a disease that's normal 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 whatever normal means um, you know I'm, I'm meant to enjoy sweet things uh, not in processed sweet but the sweet of fruit and the sweet of vegetables uh, you know in the summertime when they're supposed to be only growing at that time so our brain. Um, uh, we click with food and that's great. But what's happened, uh, and here's where the disease part comes in, is that the clicks have been overwhelmed. And and uh, I mean, essentially what we're talking about is dopamine here. Um, the onslaught of too many bangs, like it, it, it's, and it's artificial. It's, it's not normal. Like we don't have, you know, fruit, 
during the winter packaged in a thing called a candy bar that's that's just beyond what our normal click rate is um uh, it becomes a bang and when that happens the brain has to adjust to that it, and i i always say that the disease is actually truly the brain just doing its job in an abnormal environment but what happens is that in it do it's doing it's, it's trying to protect you it's trying to make it essentially you know that this concept of tolerance where you where you need more to get the same effect is just the brain saying vera you've had too much of this and we've got to make this feel normal back to that original click uh, and it co constantly is a bang and that's dangerous. So we've got to start uh, uh, putting barriers against all of this sugar in such a way that now I need more just to get that damn hit, um, which I will remember as a bang. Cause you know, once you've had a click, here's that idea of once you're a pickle, you're, you're, you're never a cucumber anymore because we've got a memory. Uh, we call that in the addiction world, euphoric recall. We have a memory now which plagues us. And so, so um, but the brain is trying to not let me have that bang, but I want the bang because I remember that was a really nice bang. Uh, so this physiological change, it's a neuroadaptation of, of uh, dopamine receptors. And so when we talk about disease, that's what we're talking about. There's an actual change. It's actually to our benefit, although it isn't really, but the brain thinks it is. And it's, it's the same kind of change that happens with depression, anxiety, bipolar, like it's in the same part of the brain. It's, it's a very similar type of process. If a person argues about disease, which so many people do, how can you be addicted? How can you, how can this be a disease? Um, then you could say that, how can you be addicted? How can you say you're depressed? How can you say that you're anxious? Well, but we know that those conditions exist. They're they're outside of the norm of normal unhappiness, normal excitement. So when you're when you're manic, you're overly, and when you're depressed, you're under. But those are actually normal feelings, but they are um, expanded. And that's what's happening here: is that something is in an abnormal reaction. Uh, it ends up being bigger, and then we're responding. So. Um, the, the problem is with this normal change, which now is an abnormal change because of the environment, um, it means now that I need more to get the same effect. And if I don't get anything, like let's say I decide I've got to quit, um, I'm going to have a physical craving because now I've become dependent. If I have tolerance and I need something to get uh, more to get uh, a certain amount, if I don't have any, I'm going to have more of a, a, of a reaction. In the normal click days, if I didn't get my favorite Brussels sprouts one day, I would just go, oh, too bad, and carry on. But if I don't get that thing that I need at night to help me sleep because I'm addicted to it, that nice slurpy white thing, you know, that dri dribbles all over me, um, uh, if I don't get that, I won't sleep. There's something else happening, and and it's because I've become dependent, and I um, physiologically, I now need this in the same way that a, an alcoholic needs their bottle of wine before they go to sleep, or their the cocaine addict needs their hit before they get out there and do stuff. So there's a physical craving. And then, uh, 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 well, then the binge happens because it's you, you're constantly chasing your tail. The body is saying, I don't want you to have this. But you, addict mind, which is that euphoric recall, it's actually just, again, a memory. It's like a post-traumatic stress memory. We remember the big. Uh, and if I have a big reaction or memory, oh, this was really nice, um, I need a lot to get that effect. So I'm going to end up needing to eat more to get that nice high. And anyway, it, it's all physical. It's it's purely physical. And we can we can tame a lot of that. I know we're going to talk about abstinence in a little bit. In fact, we I'll stop here because that's a whole other topic. Can anyway. I ask you really quickly, Vera, because yeah. I, you said, um, you know, once a pickle, you can't go back to being a cucumber. And like yeah. you're talking about actual changes to the brain that are like, like they're different chemistry. Like it's not it's not just yeah. like, oh, I, I want it too much or something psychological. It's physical. Like there's a yeah. physical difference. in the Yeah, there, there's a physical difference. And and even when you are in um, withdrawal and you, you know, we follow the abstinence plan, which we'll talk about it in a little bit. And the person gets clean and sober and it's now two or three, four months. And they say, I don't think about sugar anymore. Uh, and, you know, they might think and this is where the addict mind goes. Hey, it's been three months. I'm surely I can have a little bit now. Um, but we find that usually the person can't because even though the person has 
reclimatize their neuro uh, neurology like their 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 uh, dopamine receptors are now upregulated they were downregulated for neuroadaptation now they're upregulated it's never back to the same so the two things are still happening one is that i am now less resilient so as amanda said i might get away with a click day but uh, I'm not I'm not as sustainable as I was at the very beginning, where I could have a whole big binge. Maybe uh, in the old days, like we binged at Christmas and we binged at Thanksgiving, and that was it. And nobody was a food addict then; they just binged on those days. But they but, but for those of us where the the neurology has been tread, uh, it's it's we don't have that resilience anymore. Uh, we're much our receptor. It, appears much more fragile and we know that this exists because look at seizure seizures there's there's something that's called kindling and that once a person has had a seizure they're more prone to having another seizure and if they have multiple seizures they are super prone to having seizures like that's essentially what's happened to us not seizures but binges uh, you know, food addiction. Thing. So, so we're physiologically, we're much more fragile and easier to slip into the bang, even when we didn't have enough. So that's one thing, that's the physical. But then there's the, the second thing, which is the uh, memory. We are uh, operant conditioning. We remember the big. And, and, and uh, uh, if I had a super good experience, first of all, the fact that I did and somebody else did you know, even early days, I, I think about the, the like early days, like a, a teenager who, who has a, their first drunk, but if they get so drunk that they're sick, but they had a lot of fun, but they got sick and then they got trouble the next day. Let's say there's two of them. One will say the next day, that was fun, but I got too sick and I can't do this because I have to study the next time. But the, 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 the alcoholic in the making is going, yeah, I was sick, but I really liked it. And I don't care. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to, to have the negative consequences. So even there. So I'm actually convinced that for those of us who are true food addicts, um, uh, we had a better reaction, like a more euphoric reaction than the normie, as it were. And so in any case, anything that is euphoria, we remember. So we're, we've got a physiological change. We're more vulnerable. Plus, we're landed with this memory of something that was far beyond a click, far beyond normal. And we don't forget that. We don't forget big things. It's it's again, it's the brain doing our job. It, it's job for us. Yeah. But it's working against us. That's such a good, that's such good knowledge. And Amanda, can you share a bit more about the, you know, we really just talked a lot about the physical side. Can you share more about this, um, the emotional barometer and the kind of work that people need to do? You know, buddy, not everybody, but many, many people in the world that aren't addicted um, to certain food substances will eat to make themselves feel better. We always, anything that we are doing in any addiction, we, we start doing it because we like the effect. The first time we did it, like Vera said, with the, when she was talking about the teenagers, one got sick, did like it, one did, one liked the effect. So they kept doing it. It worked. They felt good. They felt ease they felt happier they weren't as shy whatever it may be so that person would have continued to use until there was overconsumption. and what i want to say is that many many people um you know overeat at christmas or they had a breakup so they eat a tub of ice cream and it's okay because they don't run the risk of going into the physical component and binging right they can binge or, or they can have a rough day, pick up, binge, and they don't run any of this risk. Um, so for the, the person that is suffering with food addiction, if we never picked up the substance, that it would, it would be a non-issue. It wouldn't matter because we're never going to have um, this physical craving that will go into a binge. The problem here, and it's the far bigger problem than the physical, is that... Um, Unless we learn how to live in life exactly as life is, we are guaranteed to hit the boiling point and hit a mental obsession. And the mental obsession is that thought that tells us eating, binging, purging, restricting is the best idea in this situation. And all the past consequences if we're addicted, 
don't come to the surface. It's crazy. It, it is. That's why they, some people talk about it like insanity. All the past, all the other millions of diets and clubs we've gone to and weight gain and weight loss and diabetes and not, all of that won't come to the surface at that moment because we're now in a mental obsession and it is the strongest thought we have. And there's something our mind will do and it'll turn that alarm off kind of like, oh, it's okay. One won't hurt me. Boom. As soon as we've had that thought, we're picking up again. Or I'll start on Monday. Or oh, I've had a hard day. I just need something to lift me up. So this is where we have to do the work, as Tosca says. So one of the things with treatment in addiction, all addiction, is that um, we we absolutely have to work on people getting physically abstinent. But then far more importantly, we have to support people to be comfortable with living their life abstinently. And that's a lot of tools around how do we learn to how to have life happen? Because it's going to happen every day and all these emotions go into our barometer. And how do we learn to have them flow out? We want stuff to flow in and flow out. And this side, the right side, is where um, most of the work is done in um, the treatment of addiction. Once people are physically sober, then we spend a lot of time working on feelings, emotions. Um, and as I say, how to, how to have things flow easily in and easily out of our emotional barometer so that we never hit the mental obsession. I'm going to put a little further. Can, can I just click a little further on the slide and then you guys can keep uh, talking? Because we have two places that were powerless on here yeah. and, and we really... You know, th this is exactly what you guys are both saying. That we're just totally powerless in both of these spots. We cannot trick these. So we have solutions in our treatment for both the physical side and the mental side. And you guys are getting into talking about that. Um, yeah. Jeff, go ahead. Can I can I jump in then? Yeah. Um, so thank you, uh, t um, uh, Amanda. So you you're talking about the mental obsession and. Uh, uh, unless you have absence, so abstinence is crucial um, uh, because. The, even the mental obsession, I was talking about the physical disease concept thing, that's dopamine, and it, it bleeds into the mental as well, because what is that mental obsession, but I want the sugar, or I want the ice cream, or I want, 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 whatever it is, and that want is dopamine, and it's a bloated uh, dopamine because of this experience of, of bangs, like it's, a bang is a big dopamine, and uh our, our normal wants, like I want to behave myself, I want to control my behavior, um, I, I want to whatever it is. It, those are those are back. They're still in the click range, and they can't compete. So we abstinence is crucial to um, get that. It, he's like a bully, or she is like a bully in the head. That's like this three year old that's saying, hey, "I want, I want," and and you can't live your life because you got this bully inside of your head, which is the uh, you know the the addict in it still in the food. So we got to get the addict out of the food. And then yes, of course, now you got to train that addict to behave in the normal life, which is uh, where uh, um, Amanda is going to go. But we, uh, abstinence is crucial and it takes time. You have to let those uh, those uh, um, dopamine receptors upregulate. It, it takes time, a few weeks. And then yes, then there's life of how do I live now without that previous bully that took care of things for me. <laughs> Go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> Just to say to add on to what you're saying, um, Vera, is that for me, like, uh, we can't get emotionally sober unless we're physically abstinent. And we can't stay physically abstinent unless we're emotionally sober. Like Absolutely. you can't do one without the other. They they don't go together. And, and you see many, many people that are getting treatment from well-meaning people that are just treating one of these, like the diet industry or even the health food industry is if we're working with addicts, they're only treating the physical part of it, the physical symptoms, but they're not giving people any of the tools to, to keep out of the food, to keep out of the mental obsession. So eventually they're gonna go back. And then you have other people that aren't treating the physical side of it at all. They're only treating the emotional part of it, the therapists, um, the eating disorder folks, a lot of them, again, well-meeting, but 
if we're only treating the emotions, if someone's just training me, and I had this for years and years before I finally got proper treatment for addiction, where I was learning how to work with my feelings and be in the world and deal with my trauma, but I was continuing to eat my addictive substance. Mm -hmm. So my brain was never going to heal. I was never, ever going to have a life of long-term um, recovery and freedom unless I'm doing both at the same time. And you must start with the physical abstinence before you work on the emotional sobriety. They have to go together, have to. I want to echo uh, Amanda's there, absolutely echo that, that um, if you just treat the physical, you're white knuckling it. And in the addiction world, we, we, we get that term. But outside of the addiction world, they don't get that term. Like you said, it's a diet and come on, what's your problem? But we get it. And, and uh, the whole piece about uh, staying sober is, I mean, you know, in the, in the 12 steps, the first three steps are getting sober. And now we still have another nine to stay sober. And uh, it, it's, it's it just the concept there that the chunk of the work is actually now in staying sober. And if you're not following that concept of addiction, you miss out on that. And that's why people keep relapsing or slipping back. Hmm, that's beautiful. And we have taken way more than 15 minutes on this slide. So let's pop along and uh, share the next slide, which hopefully is a little quicker. And uh, this slide is, uh, well, I'm pretty sure I don't need to explain it. Do you, do you want to jump in, Amanda? Sure. Um, this is, you know, a lot of people uh, decide that they want to get help in their life because of symptoms. You know, uh, there might be physical symptoms um, like diabetes or being overweight um, or mental. They're depressed or they're anxious. Uh, they, people might have money issues, work issues, issues dealing in relationships. Life isn't going well. And that what that is what allows them to feel uncomfortable. And that's what they want to come for treatment for. And in the um, disease model of addiction, and if addiction is present, we actually need to treat the addiction first before we want to treat any of the symptoms. And, and in my opinion, if we're getting support for our symptoms and we're addicted, it's actually harmful. We are enabling people to carry on in the addictive cycle because we're easing their life. We're helping them maybe with their... Uh, they're losing weight or they're getting support with how to um, they're getting couples counseling so they can, uh, you know, work with their um, partner better. So we're easing their symptoms, but the addictive cycle is still going on and on. So people will actually stay in the addictive cycle longer. And I promise you that if we treat the addiction first, all the symptoms slowly start to get better. And then we can, things that don't get better, we can get a lot of help with them. But like Vera was saying, we must treat the addiction first, which is the powerlessness of the physical and the mental side of it. Yeah. And you know, a, a classic example, you didn't say this, but I really want to bring this out because we see this all the time is, is uh, the physical uh, ramific ramifications of uh, food addiction is this weight. And so people come in, they want, they want to deal with their weight loss. And we you know, say, look, we get it. We absolutely get it. And, you know, we all of us boast, hey, I lost 100 pounds and kept it off. But it wasn't because I thought about the weight. Well, that's not true. I did think about the weight, but I didn't. I, that wasn't the uh, it, that wasn't the um, goal. Uh, that wasn't why I did it. I did it because I wanted to stop the insanity of the thinking. So what we say is put the focus on the addiction and the weight will take care of itself in a, in as much as it should. And it, it it's so different with people. And and often in my Facebook group, I see people saying, hey, you know, I've, I've lost five pounds and I've only lost two pounds now. And and, and I want to, I, I do say uh, that focus on weight, whether you gained weight or lost weight or haven't lost enough or you're stable, any one of those is grounds for a relapse. Because if you lost a lot of weight, the addict mind is going to go, hey, that means I can have a little bit now because I lost my weight. If you haven't gained enough weight or lost enough weight, you'll say, it's not working. I may as well. Like the, the addict mind will use weight because it's such a thing. So it, we, we can't look at that. But the good news is most of the time, most of the time, the weight will take care of itself, not right when you want it, but within the year or so, uh, unless you're already at a normal weight. And uh, then it takes them a, a lot longer. And, and, you know, that's, it's not about the weight, although that will be an impact. 
And it's the same, we can say the same thing about diabetes and uh, other metabolic issues. You know, I've heard a lot of um, stories about, we kind of talk about like whack-a-mole, right? Where, um, and I've got this metaphor of like pulling a weed, like you, you know, if you don't get the roots out, it pops up somewhere else. Can you guys talk about, like, I, I believe, you know, people try to treat the symptom of weight with like bariatric surgery, and then they end up like being alcoholic because mm. they can't eat anymore, so they drink. Um, can you guys talk about whack-a-mole or cross addictions? Yes. Uh, do you want to go first, Amanda, or should I? I, I don't want to go on and on. Yeah. Here. No, okay. I love listening to you. Oh, well, okay. So, I mean, it, it, remember, it's about dopamine and dopamine has many faces. Like it's many roads lead to Rome. It's just a rush. And so we see a lot of people who are, um, uh, you know, stop the food. Well, you, typically what happens is, is they stop the smoking cigarettes or they stop the drinking and then they pick up food because it's encouraged uh, uh, to uh, eat instead of doing those things. Because those things will kill you. Guess what? Ours will kill you more likely than those will. I mean, they will too. But anyway, um, so if we don't understand this whole addiction piece, remember that's three quarters of the problem is what do I do now? Then the, the dopamine monster, that little thing inside my head that now is I can't eat, my mouth is 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 closed, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it somewhere else. And so we see that with spending, we see that with social media, we see that with work, we see that there's many ways that you can get make what is a normal click into a bang you know like it's it's uh, dopamine is a neurochemical of anticipation and excitement so anything that gets you excited is is up for up for uh, grabs amanda how prevalent is this with the people that you work with that come to shift like the cross addictions oh boy i, I mean it's <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's huge. And and I can say, you know, even for my own story, you know, I was always a bit of a chubby kid, not that overweight. But, you know, in high school, I found alcohol, drugs and boys and I didn't eat food anymore, you know. And what I can tell you with my own story is when I put alcohol and drugs down, my food came on with a vengeance. Um, so I am absolutely one of those people. And I had weight loss surgery. I mean, I, I did all the things. Um and it all got me to, you know, well over 300 pounds and, you know, diabetic, giving myself needles every day and, and all of that. And yeah, I mean, we, we are constantly working with people that either have put down drugs and alcohol and are now just in the same boat uh, with food. And, and it's actually worse because for what I often say to these people is that they've actually never been truly sober because some of them come to me, they've been drug-free and alcohol-free for 30 years, but they've had the food the whole time. And they're like, it's so hard. Why can't I do this? It's because really, this is your first time being sober. This is your first time being sober. Um, and so of course it's going to be harder. And then a lot of people, if they don't have drugs and alcohol first, if they aren't doing the uh, mental emotional side of the recovery, they'll put down food and they go to media or shopping or gambling or love addiction or exactly what Vera was just talking about. And that's why it's so crucial that both parts of our disease get treated because all of these substances are a solution for us. They are a solution. It's just not a very sustainable long-term solution. Um, and it's not very freeing. So we need to learn a different solution, as I was saying, so that we can be comfortable in this world without the high of being addicted to something. Yeah. Prosca, I also just... I just, okay. sorry, Vera, this, I'm going to, I just saw someone's comment come in um, from Kim's and I just wrote Kim's and I wanted to make a note earlier just about all I saw was, and if we're not overweight, and I do really want to acknowledge many, many, many people are what we would consider. And I, I hate the word, but I don't know what else to say, a healthy weight or normal weight or whatever the word is. And they're still food addicted. You don't have to be overweight or underweight to be food addicted. And it actually, in my opinion, can be harder for those people for two reasons to get um, into long-term recovery. One is because they don't have the desperation necessarily of the physical part of the disease. Um, and also people don't take them very seriously. Um, so sorry, Vera, I, I interrupted there. I just, I had a note I wanted to get back to your comment, Kim. Yeah, I, I uh, 
I, I agree with that. Absolutely. It's not about the weight. It's it's about the obsession. And and a lot of people are are compensate by over exercise by, uh, you know, intermittent fasting. I hope we get to talk about that at some point. We're coming uh, to that next slide. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they find ways to uh, uh, make it so that their weight is okay, but they're still crazy inside. Um, what, what I what I wanted to say about this slide, I uh, just add to, to what Amanda's saying is that, you know, that in the middle, it's his addiction. Our dis-ease makes us restless, irritable, and discontent. Well, again, it's the click and the bang. Like Buddha says, life is suffering. We all have, have a predisposition, a, pre, a, a tendon pre- I don't know what the word is, to be slightly irritable, slightly discontent. We have to be, because otherwise we'd be just sitting there and, and uh, not thriving uh, or uh, getting up out of bed doing stuff and being cautious and aware. And, you know, that that's a cost. It's the cost of slight restlessness and irritability, but that's at click level. And if I uh, have a quote, spiritual discipline, which is what we teach in that uh, three quarters of the rest of our time not eating, we have to learn how to have a spiritual discipline, which is just to, at, at the click level, not be irritable, restless, and discontent. I just got to learn how to be grateful in the morning, be whatever the practice is, mindful, and I can even that out. But in addiction, where it's bang, I, it doesn't work. That stuff doesn't work. Like it's, it's like, we're just run, 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 run. We're just impossible. Um, so it, it's, it, once you get, once you get abstinent, you still, you're still living in this like big emotion, bang emotion. And uh, we've got to learn how to do extra work. That's the work that's required to get us back down to just the click level of, uh, irritability and discontent and occasionally occasionally have happy moments content moments <laughs> yeah that's beautiful thank you and and i i know we had a question up above too about um how to get physically abstinent and you know what to do with the food and we're going to go to that slide next but just before we flipped off of this slide i wanted to say you know just for everybody watching to to just look at this and challenge yourselves where are you just seeking to take care of the symptoms you know and like, to me, when I see all the, there's a 12 step group for every single thing out there, they're all just windows in to, to the deeper work. It, it's just a pathway in. So you're being invited to go deeper and um, just challenge yourself with that. So, all right, the next slide. Point, yeah. Point. Will take us to a uh, very, this slide has a lot on it. So it might take us a bit. Um, but you, you've heard us talking about the slippery slope, and um, we refer to like addictive eating as being down in the ditch. And um, so there's a lot on the slide, but this is all going to be about the physical abstinence. And um, I'll walk us through it a little bit. But we we say t eating certain things keeps us on the slippery slope. The BLT stands for bites, licks, and tastes, where um, <laughs> for many of us, you can't, uh, if I'm cooking and I take a little bite, uh, that's uh, I'm on the slippery slope. I will slide down to addictive eating. And different foods that can be coffees that can be triggers, different triggering foods. And how do we draw, you know, how do we draw a line for that? So um, one of the first places I want to pause this slide is at the, the normal people, and we've kind of touched on this already. How, how come normal people can, can go into a binge and then just drive back up to safety? Like, what, Vera, what's different about their brains? Do we know at this point? This yeah, there, there's a resilience because it, it hasn't been overwhelmed. It, it's like, why does a person that similarly eats eat sweeteners or flour and sugar and not become diabetic? We don't become diabetic just because we've done. We become a diabetic when we're doing that stuff um, too much, and it's overwhelming the insulin receptors, and we're becoming insulin resistant. And then this whole thing, it, it, because that's an, it's too much of a basically too much of a good thing, and the body then has to readapt. And so as long as and and we're allowed a certain level of of pleasure. And so when people say, ah, you got to enjoy life you know, have a little bit once in a while, I know they're coming from normal mindset. They're coming from this because they can still do that. I can't do that anymore because I've had all my normal things in my first year of life. Like it's, it's, it's long gone. You know, it's like they used say, it all up. <laughs> yeah, I used it all up. Uh, I, I mean, there, there's a neuroadaptation that's happened 
with uh, us and not with uh, uh, the normal person. But that normal person, if they continually do that in today's society where they're invited to have, you know, the, the binge, not, not just at Christmas and New Year's, but all the time, they're going to be in our shoes too. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of time. And I think some of us get there more quickly. And that's because of uh, genetics and uh, emotional stress as a child, all those things. The, you, you can become predisposed more quickly, but everybody's going to get on this uh, slippery slope eventually in today's food environment. Mm, that's interesting. So I've got I've got us on early stage being maybe a person who can kind of fight their way up the, yeah. Up yeah. the slope, but a late stage, I consider myself, uh, you know, in a wheelchair. And, um, and yes. I see uh, I see someone commented about nuts and avocados. And let me make it clear, these are just examples, okay? It's, this is not like nuts and avocados. Are, there's plenty of people who do eat them. And that's what makes it so tricky to stay on this road. And um, so one of the things I included in this is that our we have a guardrail. For those of us, many of us who live in what we call food neutrality, we have a guardrail, which is a food plan and a sponsor that's just like a line in the sand. And for some people, avocados would be in the line and some it's out. It depends on the food plan. There's a thousand of them. So how do we do this? Um, I've got, we, you just, know what, if I can just say that yeah. guardrail, you call that a guardrail. I call that a guardrail, but the person out there who doesn't understand will say, Oh God, you're being so rigid with those rules. That's what they see, but we see it as a guardrail. And, and you know, this is like a, a different perceptions. Mm, yeah. And I, and I use a food or a food commitment. I commit what I'm going to eat and I don't change it. And I use a scale to weigh and measure my food. And these things keep me on this road, very safe. Um, and I know, Vera, you were going to talk about this side as well, the too restrictive side, because we can get too restrictive with our food. And that's also a problem for us, right? Do you want to address that? Uh, yes, yes. Um, the intermittent, well, the two, so there's a couple of things, like the too restrictive. One of the things that we know uh, with food addiction is that there, we're not exactly sure um if it's the same thing, but a continuum, or if it's a dual diagnosis, but uh, we do know that there's a high, high, high overlap with eating disorders. And um, uh, the people in the eating disorder field that, who don't actually acknowledge us very much, but they themselves will say that um, intermittent fasting can be dangerous for their clientele because it will trigger their their uh, um, their disorder. I mean, they also will say about us that these guardrails will trigger the disorder. So I, you know, you have to go with what, but so there, if, when I see somebody who's doing intermittent fasting, I always think, first of all, is there an eating disorder that's being um, unearthed or allowed as it were, permissed? Um, okay, so there's that. But the other thing that I worry about, especially in new uh, 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 recovery, new food addiction recovery, is that um, yeah, when you're being very restrictive, let's be honest, is it because you're trying to cut down your calories and basically diet yourself to lose weight. And so many of us in the food addiction world have been through that. And um, that I see as just another addictive pattern because it's restricting then leading to binging. Um, and, and that makes sense because the, the, the brain is going, where's the food? And so uh, it doesn't know that you're following a, a, a restrictive pl a pattern. It just knows you're hungry and therefore, um, uh, you better stock up as soon as there's food. And so when you're hungry, dopamine is enhanced and you want, you taste food more. And in fact, people will do, and this is where I see that intermittent fasting can be a problem. If I see this is when they uh, re restrict their food to just eating at night. So they're not eating all day and they're eating at night because the food will be extra tasty. And so now it gets, and, and now, now they're dealing with a potential binge problem. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if somebody is wanting to do intermittent fasting, I would say, fine, do that. Wait until you've got some recovery. And then you have you can't really do intermittent fasting and be hungry um, and expect not to binge. The way to intermittently fast safely is to do it in a way that you will not be hungry, which means that you're not eating processed foods and sugars. You're fat adapted. You're eating a lot of proteins and fats and no a food addict in recovery isn't there yet. Like they have to change their whole diet because they're still eating garb. They're still eating uh, the, the processed foods, which will make them super hungry and then uh, will facilitate that binge cycle. So it, I think it's a very useful tool, but not in early recovery. And it's, it's, it's like, it's like, um, 
uh, in medic in some medications, they're really useful, but you want to use them very carefully because they're also very dangerous. I see it as that. Mm. And it should be done with a coach that is um, not you. <laughs> That's exactly what I do. I was just going to ask Amanda that question about, um, you know, how many people come in and they want to write their own food plan and, and just to talk about food plans and, and why can't, you know, what do you see happen when people come in and it's like, well, here's our food plan. Uh, you know, what kind of responses do we get from that? Yeah, I think that's a great food plan. This is like the conversation that everybody wants to talk about when they're coming into treatment and and not even people in treatment the doctors and the scientists and everyone in this and all the debate and and here's the thing you know when we're dealing with abstinent when we're dealing with addiction what we need is a food plan that is free of the substances that we're addicted to and the behaviors free of the behaviors that we're addicted to and you know, it is different with people with food addiction for different people. And I also want to say, I don't think it's as different as people think it is. I think we want to make it more complicated and more different than it really is. And um, the deal is, is that, you know, the most common foods that we're addicted to is all sugars and sweeteners of any kind. Um, all flowers of any kind, and very often volume of food. Those are the most common. The next one would be um, grains, uh, some people with fats. And so, and I, I, I really do know several food plans um, that are a little bit different, but kind of have those basics um, and they work for people. So I don't want, when people are first coming into treatment, especially those of us, I was one of them, that has a lot of knowledge about the nutrition world, it's not helpful. It actually, we see people that come in with a head full of knowledge about nutrition actually um, struggle, relapse far more than other people because they're trying to use this knowledge that they have about the health industry and bring it into the getting sober in, in addiction. And we just can't do that in early days of recovery. And when I say early days, I'm meaning like, I really believe the first two to three years, like we just can't mess around. And so it's like, you come in, you get a food plan and you need to follow that food plan exactly as it's written, unless you have major medical issues mm. um, and just surrender to it. Just surrender to it, which is so hard for us. It's not anything that we want to do. And so many people will say, and, and Vera was talking about this, well, this is too restrictive. And you know, what I what I can share with you is my experience, my experience that when people get free of their addictive substances and behaviors, they have more freedom than they've ever had in their brain. Because if we're eating just a little bit of something that gives us a little charge, we're not free because we're always thinking about it. Oh, I shouldn't eat that. That's too much. Oh, I can have a little bit more. Oh, I better not have it right now. What if I, that isn't freedom. Freedom is when we're not thinking about it. We want food neutrality, which is why Tosca's got these guardrails here. These practices um, that, you know, the most common treatment centers use, um, we use them because they work. They really, really work. And the less negotiating that's done, it would literally be, in my opinion, like someone coming in, one of my clients coming into drug and alcohol treatment saying, okay, so I'm willing, you know, I'll be sober, but on the weekend, I'm just going to have one beer. Like it doesn't work. And they're trying to tell us what is right for them. And of course that's what they want because it feels good. Um, so it's really that place of just about letting go and trusting. And I wasn't willing to do that until I was so desperate and unhappy. Um, and it wasn't about my weight anymore. Yeah, I was 350 pounds, but I was just so miserable that I was willing for the first time ever in my life to just do what I was told. And even that term, do what I was told, like my, my shoulders still come up, like that is not who I am. But I can't make up, like Vera said, when she said you need a coach that's going to help you, but you're not the coach. I can't write my own 
plan around a substance that I literally can't think straight about, but I think I can. We have a disease that tells us my thinking makes sense, even though I have all the evidence in the world, it doesn't. Um, and this isn't a plan about making people feel comfortable or meeting, you know, often people will say, well, we'll just go slowly. Th that to me is like pure hell to take people off their food slowly, you know, then they're craving and they're white knuckling. So anyways, you can tell I'm passionate about this subject, but, you know, um, and it does take time. This isn't easy until it is. It isn't easy until it is. And it's not easy in the beginning. And when we're in treatment, that's why you go, many people need to go to some sort of treatment because it's really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult at first. Mm -hmm. And it goes against so many ways that we've been in the world. And it goes against the way we've been trained in the diet industry and the natural or the health food industry. It, it goes against that. And it's, it's not that those things are wrong, that certain diets or health food or all this information, it's not that they're wrong. But when it comes to treating the disease of addiction, we must treat the disease as the primary and focus on that. And the other stuff can come later. And in my opinion, much later. Mm. I, I, I think Tosca, the next slide is about the willpower piece, right? Um, I want to. Well, I I talk about there's a little bit more on this one. Um, I was going to click forward. Oh, I got food freedom. I have uh, this poor little early stage person battling themselves up and down the hill, and I, I know there's probably a lot, a million people in this spot thinking I'm not going to be addictive. I'm not, and then they're sliding backwards, and eventually, you know, we slip and fall. Um, I, I actually was wondering, um, if people, you know, I hear people say, well, that doesn't trigger me, you know, and I'm thinking of this early stage person saying, well, that doesn't trigger me. Um, can you, either of you guys speak to that? Like, do, are people able to, in early stages, know what's, tr what food triggers them? Like, you know, well, coffee doesn't trigger me. I hear that a lot. Fair, fair enough. Like, but, you know, like, like we say in AA or other places, not yet, you know, so what, addiction is chronic and progressive. And certainly early days, um, things, it, 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 as long as the person keeps eating triggering foods, and the disease is allowed to continue, eventually, those things will become a problem. I mean, I used to be able to eat grains, no problem, I can't eat them anymore. And that's, that's being sober, like, like, just over time. So I, I Sure. Uh, if, if a person is in click level uh, and they can get away with it, then fine. But if they're already struggling, uh, be careful or be aware that that what might not be sweeteners, for example, might not be a trigger. Uh, but be aware at some point in the in in your life, maybe five, ten years, maybe not, but it's likely they will become a problem, and you'll have to constantly negotiate. Which is why we always say you should be in community with people that can help you. Say, hey, Vera, you're using a lot of sweeteners. Like, was that six things of sweeteners in your coffee? There's a problem. I didn't see that. Um, but I, I do want to say something about the surrender that uh, Amanda said, and that's got to do with willpower. So when can I say that? Go for it. Yeah, I think right now, Vera, Go right when it, Tosca yeah. was having that what was person the, up and down the... Yeah, okay. Um, uh, what's the next slide? I, I just it's about say... that curve. Oh, oh, on that curve next. Okay, no, then I'll just go yeah. back. I just want to say something about willpower because Amanda, you hit it right on the head. You know, we we uh, don't want to uh, surrender. We don't want to. We're not used to it. We like to be, run the show. But you know, that's if you're living at the level of normal click, then of course we have willpower, and it's uh, we have a certain amount of juice in a day to maintain normal life. But when you're living in these abnormal uh, extremes, willpower is it's it's just too small. It's not a, a powerful enough entity. And um, it is it is dwarfed by that baby or monster inside the addiction piece that gets bigger and bigger. In, in normal circumstances, the willpower moderates. It's like parent moderates the, the whining baby. But the whining baby is so big now that parent cannot simply do anything. And and uh, we have to uh, you're, you're trying to parent yourself, but you can't because your tools, the willpower is in a part of the brain that is just not built to be as powerful as um, the addiction part. The addiction part has hijacked my instinct, my motivation, my emotion. And those things are meant to be more powerful than willpower. Because if a truck is coming or there's danger, I don't wanna be 
trying to figure out what to do and think about it and how to behave. I just want to get out of the way. I just want to respond. And and uh, addiction takes that part and makes that even bigger. So you're you're um, when you're counting on willpower, um, you're not recognizing that it's not an even playing field anymore. It's not. And so I have to surrender. And Amanda, if you're my coach, I, I have to trust you, obviously, because otherwise I'm going to follow the wrong person. But I have to trust you to say, I don't know what to do. I know what I want to do, but I don't know if it's right. And you, with the clear head, because you're not me in the middle of it, will say, no, Vera, I'm going to essentially parent you or be your ego, be your uh, your uh, willpower until you can reclaim your own when there's a, more of an even playing ground. Mm, that actually, I think that leads perfectly into the next little pe the end of this slide, which is many okay. of us feel like we're just getting squished by this. You know, we draw a line like, oh, I can I can actually have things on the outside of that line. But if we if we're surrendered, we're still in this, you know, we're safe from our addiction, which is way better than drawing the line yeah. far too down the hill, in which case we are hitting things that trigger us. And then we're just going to end up sliding right down in the hill. So um that you know that's the point of it like i i saw someone right up here confused nuts and avocados derail food freedom and i don't think that's the point i think it's the point is surrendering to like yes. you said vera somebody else's judgment because my brain doesn't work right you obviously have to trust the person and so you do your homework like don't go but but you or trust the group or trust the whatever trust the process um like do your homework ahead of time but i'm i'm sorry to say it at this level your willpower and your adult ability to do things is 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 dwarfed by this thing inside of you hmm. yeah thanks all right we're gonna say oh. i just want to say this quickly it's okay it's okay you can move um on tosca to the different slide is that i think you know, there's more knowledge than ever out there in this world about food and what's in it and and you know this is not a bad thing however it is, um, this to me is such a barrier for the food addict because we have people, including me, <laughs> coming into uh, treatment that have all this knowledge and yet we're totally food addicted. We're totally face down in the food, whether we're underweight, healthy weight, overweight, and yet we're still trying to debate, well, what about all this knowledge with, that we have? That knowledge will not help you in this recovery at this stage. It just won't. It will hinder you. So it's like we got to take that knowledge and put it on the table and let me treat my primary. And gosh, I know it's hard, but I we go up against this battle. I mean, this is all I do is work in food addiction treatment and have been doing for 10 years. I'm in the trenches with people and this is over. And it's getting more and more. The more knowledge that's out there about food, the more we're coming up against it. And the more I just see it's wreaking so much havoc on people because the knowledge isn't helping them, but they want to use it to cure themselves. And it just won't at this stage. It just will not. It will not. I, I can't be more clear than that. Mm, thank you. So here's our final slide. And we are definitely have gone over our original 15 minutes per slide. But this is such good stuff. You guys are really sharing a lot of good stuff. So Amanda, do you want to talk about this? I guess you and uh, Phil developed this. Is that the case? No, this is the, the gel knit curve. We did not develop it. Someone else developed it. We changed it. Um, we kind of added it and uh, put it, put some more words in and we, we changed it to be, uh, to do with food addiction as opposed to drug and alcohol addiction, which is how it was originally, uh, um, written. And so it just talks about the progression. Um, you know, like we can see at the top on the left-hand side, someone starts, uh, like Vera was saying, we can, people start with a, occasionally having binges, um, meaning they eat too much at Christmas or they eat a pint of ice cream when they're having a hard day, or they go out and get drunk on the weekend or, you know, not a big deal. And then you can see, and again, we keep using because we liked the effect. It's important to know that we liked the effect or we didn't like the effect as the example Vera gave. And then we liked the effect. And so we kept using and we kept using and, and we kept using. And then slowly 
consequences start coming in our life as we as we keep eating um and you know we start um feeling bad about ourselves we don't talk about it we um you know we might start lying and it just um gets bigger and bigger as we go down and, and all these um characteristics come a lot with with people that are in active addiction um it's the symptoms we start having all these symptoms again um and then you can see it just keeps getting worse and worse until you know addiction has set in and we are uh, meaning now our brain has changed as vera talks about we now are obsessed with food um and we actually need food to feel normal um, or we need to restrict to feel normal, or we need to purge to feel normal. Um, and we're thinking about it. We're either thinking about how we can get food, how much food we ate, how what the diet that we're going to go on. You know, this is all in here. And often when we're we're right down here, um, things are really, really rough. We've tried everything we possibly know how to do. You know, we've we've gone um to the gyms, we've gone on all the Pamway diets. Uh, for me, I had weight loss surgery. We've exhausted everything that my brain, all my own answers, I've exhausted. Um, and then um, we decide to get uh, help. And then this goes up kind of the intervention and the um, recovery phases. Um, and we start, not only do we, st we deal with our physical addiction, but literally everything in our life changes. And so, so kind of, that's, what's going on here. Um, so that's just the over, overarching, um, kind of theme of what a gel net curve is. And this one's about food addiction. So this is, so this that was originally, originally, oh, sorry, go ahead. Let me just add to that, that, um, yeah, so the gel net curve was made for uh, drugs and alcohol. And I just want to bring it back to that, that um, the seriousness of this condition, um, so many people will say food, it's not that serious, don't worry about it. It's better to eat than drink, all that kind of stuff. Um, but first of all, the seriousness, it is just about dopamine. It's just one more way to follow this curve it's this should be called the well it's the gel curve because that's the name of the person who did it but uh, it's basically the dopamine uh curve and so it could be anything there and just just to bring home the fact that alcohol kills opiates kill cocaine crack you know the person out there who who is giving up their last 20 dollars so that they will be on the street instead of somewhere for their rent in in a warm place tonight um uh went through the very same thing that you and i go through and we say I, I know I shouldn't, but I, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'm just going to spend this 20 bucks and I'll be outside in the cold because just because it's the very same dilemma. And we see it out there so clearly uh, and, and it's disguised here um, in, uh, and, but it, it, it is just as, just as bad. It's just, we don't see it until 10 or 15 years later and we call it something else. So okay. anyway, I just want to say, fine. yeah. I was going to say the slow motion nature of food addiction yes. makes it actually harder to treat. Is that true? Well, it's certainly, uh, can I just say, I, Amanda, I know you have something to say about this, but let me just say that uh, I have many people, because I work in the field of drugs and alcohol, and people will say to me, it is harder to quit sugar than crystal meth. And crystal meth is nasty. It's a hard one. Uh, you, 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 you can ruin your life within two years if you get cooked on crystal meth. They have a harder time than quitting sugar. Um, lots of alcoholics do very well quitting alcohol, and then they just move to sugar. You get them off the sugar, and now they're back to the alcohol. So um, uh, it it. it it is just as it, it's it's slower, but it's as hard. It's just it's it's under the radar, and you know that's the problem. We don't get the same support out in the community as we do with alcohol and other drugs. Go ahead, Amanda. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. Well, Vera, I'm just so glad that you just brought in that that emphasis on like how brutal this disease of food addiction is and how serious it is. Like it is fatal. It is fatal. And um, boy, oh boy, sometimes 
you know, those of us that know the big book, they talk about, you know, the doctors being in the trenches with people trying to deal with alcoholism years ago. And I, I, I want to say to people so often, try being in the trenches treating food addicts mm. every day. It is brutal what we see. And I'll say this harder to treat. I, I can say, first of all, you know, I, I worked in the drug and alcohol treatment field before I did this, before I worked with food addicts. And at one point I had to choose in my career. And I knew working with drug addicts and alcoholics was actually easier for me. They were easier to treat. Um, and so, but but I knew I was called to do this because this actually was, uh, you know, my disease that took me down. But but what I want to say is, and I think Vera said it, you know, we're under the radar. I think that's one of the reasons it's so hard to treat. And because I believe the food addiction treatment world has, um, has competition, which is crazy to say. And our competition is the diet world and the health industry. Um, there's so much information about their, you know, how to get healthy, how to get well, how to lose weight. And so everyone thinks that's the problem. And for many people it is, but for people that are food addicts, they just get whipped around in circles of trying to get help and trying to get support and never being able to. And um, and then there, there is just no support. I shouldn't say no. Here we have a doctor sitting here. There is very little support in the medical industry about food addiction. And there's so many reasons for that. One of them is the, the big food industry, which is a whole other conversation, which I won't go down. But um, so there's those reasons, as well as uh, one is food is so normal. It's all around us. And we have to keep eating. We do have to keep eating. Um, and that's why we actually need more parameters around eating than um, like when I'm sober, I don't do, I don't commit, you know, an, a, a sober plan, how I'm going to stay alcohol sober to my sponsor every day. But I do commit a food plan because I know food is slippery for me. So I say, this is exactly what I'm going to eat and food is everywhere. Um, it's acceptable. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's so much shame around, you know, people's body sizes and it just, it just goes on and on. I also think it's often one of our first addictions. Most of us yeah. don't pick up drugs and alcohol until, I mean, maybe 12 or 13, you know, some are younger and some are much older, but with food, many of us are picking this up, you know, when we're babies or even when we're getting breastfed. Um, and so, we started it much early. It started coming into our systems much, much earlier. So it's that much harder to treat. Um, yeah, I could talk forever. So I will well, be quiet I, about that. I, I want to jump in, Amanda, on, on what you said about the competition, because somebody in the chat, just uh, Sheila, just mentioned about uh, the eating disorder world. Like that's there, there's our competition there. There's more than that, but that's a big one. And, and you know, the, the funding goes there. Physicians will apply to that because it has the... Uh, um, the accept the, the medical stamp of approval. And it's it's so not helpful for our particular population. It's in fact quite dangerous for our population. But that's it. We're dealing with competition. The food industry loves the eating disorder model because it's essentially, what does she say there? What one we want to be neutral around our Snickers bars and our donuts. So yeah, exactly. So, therefore it's my fault. I haven't figured it out if I'm still eating if I can't just have one Snickers bar and one donut a day. Anyway, it's, yeah. Amanda, I wanted to ask you, um, like when oh, yeah. people are down in that bottom cycle, um, how do how do they present and how do you connect with people to get them to take the steps out? I mean, do you, you know, what kind of interventions do you need to do? I mean, people get really, really sick. Well, you know, and I don't, there's not a uh, one prescription for all. It, it, it really depends on, on where someone's at. And the truth is, if someone's not ready, they're not ready. If someone's not ready, they're not ready. However, I do believe us as providers, we can um, support people to lower, um, you know, get them to their bottom quicker. We can bring their bottom up to them. I, I've witnessed it. I've seen it with people, you know, people that I'm working with that are, that are in a lot of relapse. You know, we start writing sober contracts with them. We do interventions with their family, just like people do with drugs and alcohol. Like the consequences for what they're doing, um, the consequences for them being in active addiction um, need to be pretty drastic. And so we can help that at times, sometimes with families that are willing. 
Um, and it's, um, but it really depends on where people are at. You know, we have people coming in, a lot of people will, if weight is an issue, you know, people that are morbidly obese or have physical symptoms that can bring them in, can hit, hit their bottom. But there's people that are coming in that are morbidly obese and have those physical symptoms and they haven't hit their bottom. There's people that are, you know, what this normal body weight that are so at their bottoms. So the presenting, uh, you, you really have to, um, talk to people, you know, like at shift, we do a lot of free consults to people just to see where they're at. Are they a food addict? There's, um, tools like the Yale food addiction scale. People can actually take a, a, um, a, not a test. What, what is it? Take a, uh, well, like do the Yale food addiction scale, um, to, to find out if, if they, if they fall into the criteria of being an addict and then, Again, it's finding the right level of treatment for them. You know, some people in earlier stages, um, what, what every single one of us need is support, tremendous amount of support. Um, this is really, really hard until it's not, um, although we need support for the rest of our lives. So for many, many people, um, we go into a 12 step group. There's many food um, 12 step groups out there and that's for the support. We need to be around other people that have the same disease as us and the same solution. Uh, and there's many people that maybe have food addiction, but they're they're working on different solutions um, that may not be working for them. So we need fellowship with people that have the same problem, the same solution. And then we often need to work with professionals, whether it's one on one, whether it's coaching, whether it's actually in a treatment program. Um, you know, like a, like we have intensive uh, virtual or in-person treatment programs, and there's some residential treatment programs that are 30 to 90 days. So it really depends on where people are at in, in their recovery, how much support they need. Um, but support, support, support. You need a phenomenal amount of support to get physically abstinent and to stay physically abstinent. Um, yeah, like if you had yeah. to map out, if you had to map out, if somebody's sit, sitting here going, what do I do next? I mean, I think it would be um, to find some way to get abstinent and then learn the tools to stay abstinent. And you just mentioned the various ways to do that, either through 12 step or a program like shift or um, other programs. Yeah. But support is essential, I think. I think. Yeah. Thank you. And I was going to say that as we wrap up here, um, this, uh, this curve, one thing I really noticed about this curve is just like the the long amount of time it takes to recover, that it's not, you know, and we hear we have the title of this breaking free from the chains of food addiction. And, you know, what can we offer people for hope as far as like, you know, how quickly can we see recovery? It looks like this is, you know, for me, I'm four years abstinent. I'm, you know, I'm still creeping up this long path to recovery. What, what, what kind of timeline can people expect um, as but they come into recovery? It, it, there, it, there is good news. Like if you do abstinence, I, I totally agree with Amanda that if you just do it piece by piece, you're just prolonging the agony. If you do abstinence, jump in the water, get cold. Um, it, it actually only takes three weeks, four weeks to get over the worst of it, the hard, you know, the hard, hard, hard. And then after that, it's still, you're going to be a lot better in two years than you are in three months, but every day gets better after that initial uh, withdrawal, which we call post-acute withdrawal in the, in the food addiction world. So you want to get lots of good, strong support like solid support in that first few weeks that where you're going to surrender and you're going to get somebody telling you what to do, essentially, whatever it is, something. Uh, and then after that, it gets easier and easier and easier. And the good news is it gets easier. Uh, and that uh, even 10 years later, like as long as you stay on the path, um, the, the worst part is the first month. And then after that, it just gets better and better and better. And people mm -hmm. will say that two or three years later, I feel better than I did. And, and that includes weight as well. You can, you can still lose weight after, uh, you know, one and a half years if you've been doing it this way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have anything to add to that, Amanda? Mm -hmm. I think it really is true. What Not I think, I know it's really true, is that it's amazing how quickly we can feel better. And um, it, you know, it's, it's, if you manage to stay abstinent, so you get the support to stay abstinent and don't mess around and try and change your food plan and you just get over that, not, I don't mean get over, like it's easy, but get yourself through that hard first period. 
it just gets easier and easier and easier and it changes. So yes, today I still do a lot of work in my recovery, but it's, it's not a lot of work for me. It's a joy. Like I have this life, I have this freedom around food and, um, I, I, I guess what I would say to people is, you know, I can't, you know, in nine years ago, when I put down, when I got food sober, it was the hardest thing I was ever going to do. I remember being in treatment, crying, saying, I don't want to give up my food. I can't imagine living my life um, without my food. I couldn't imagine it. And, and I remember I was in treatment for a week and I said, I can do this here, but I'll never do that out there. And, you know, one day at a time, I have done it. And, and it, and I don't know how I got over that first couple of months and it was really, really hard. Um, but it has just been so unbelievable. And it, it got not hard fairly quickly in the grand scheme of things for how long I'd been doing it. Um, and if I want to keep that freedom though, there is work I still need to do. And I just saw someone say, are the three of you in recovery programs? I'll speak for myself. I'm absolutely in a recovery program. I'm in a 12 step recovery program. I have outs, I help, I see a counselor. Um, and I hope I do that for the rest of my life, both of those things, because they give me the life I have. Without those, my emotional barometer, my mental stuff would start filling up and eventually I'd have no choice but to go back into the food. So it's not a chore. It's not hard work for me anymore. So I absolutely work a, uh, a recovery program. Mm. Thank you. Well, I'm going to stop sharing this because we have come to the end of our slides and it was such a great discussion. Can I say something as yes, a sort of closing please. statement before there's questions? I just want to say that uh, this is not my phrase, but I really like this phrase, uh, which is choose your heart. Yes, it is hard uh, to, to be in recovery, especially in that first month. But man, is it hard to be a food addict with my face in the food. That was really hard. This is actually hard, but not as hard. So uh, it, it, there is actually good news. And then also there is even better news, which is after that month, you will be free of your damn obsessions of food you will be uh, maintaining a weight or losing the weight and then knowing you will maintain that weight so there won't be that up and down nonsense and you'll just overall be feeling much better about yourself like it, there, it, there's, this, there's no question that life is sweet enough <laughs> without that stuff that's it that's great. That's awesome. So I was just going to, I mean, my final wrap up question was just do you, what advice would you give to people, which I know you already kind of went into Vera. Um, and I was thinking of like the new people, we were talking a lot to new people. Do you guys have any advice you'd say to someone who's just like chronically relapsing or on that slippery slope a lot? Like what, what should we do? What are the action steps? Either one of you, both of you get whatever support you need to get abstinent um i would say and if that means that you have to bite the bullet and and sign up for a program do if it means you got to go into 12 step and you don't like the god thing do it anyway find a place that's more agnostic um like like get the support there's always going to be a problem with whatever it is it's too expensive i don't like that person i don't like the god thing i don't like whatever it is just do it anyway because you will you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because there's truly a life that's worth living and and just make things work for you and the good news is the, the fabulous news is is that amanda i know you know this too 10 years ago we didn't have the resources we have today we have so many resources now and and uh it just you, you have to be discerning obviously but um get out there because it's there and we need you to to be successful so that you can then go and turn around and tell your children and your family members because they're going to say to you how did you do that and they're going to go i don't want to do that and you're going to say i feel so much better do it <laughs> there that's my bit yes i mean i don't think i have much different um than vera other than um if you're really struggling, whether you're brand new or you're in relapse, first of all, I want to tell you is that there really is, uh, this is not a word of a lie. If you get proper treatment, you never have to eat again. You don't have to. You don't ever have to compulsively eat again. I I, I guarantee you that. Yep. And so find proper support. Find people professionals that really understand the disease of addiction. And Toss is going to give you some resources um find people that really understand um 
the um, world of addiction in, and that are doing the same thing of you that have w walked your walk and are healed and in recovery and do what they're doing. Don't make up your own rules. Don't try and make it easier for you because I promise you it is not easier. Maybe in the beginning it is, mm -hmm. but it is not easier to make up do it a little bit your way. It is way, way, way harder. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's what I can say. That, that's what I can say. Yeah. There is so much hope. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's that's my experience too, a lot of hope. So so if you guys are willing, I know uh, Vera has to go shortly, um, but uh, I'm planning to stay on after um, and answer any questions. Um, you know, shift at shift, we do a treatment that, you know, it's like a in-person eight day treatment um, and, you know, amazing what, how much can be broken and, and, and um, the path you can be on by the end of eight days, you know, you can be detoxed and well on your way. So there is a lot of hope here. And um, if you guys have, I mean, we have some questions that have come out. I think we've addressed a lot of them, but if we could take maybe just a couple more questions, yeah. we'll let you guys go. Mm. Well, I see, Kim, you look, you look like you're ready for help, Kim. Um, and we're with you. We've all been right there, so. Uh definitely understand the feeling of fear. I used to think, how will I, how will I possibly be able to sleep without having my bag of whatever it was that I was going to eat? Like I won't be able to sleep. <laughs> I sleep wonderfully now, <laughs> but I get the fear. Yeah. 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 And I have, uh, I have to say, I, when it comes to food plans, I think every food plan has to have something that we think is stupid in it because <laughs> in my experience, I've got to surrender. I have to have that surrender. So no matter what it is, I need surrender more than I need whatever it is. Um, Kim, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, where did you go? Oh, I saw you for a second. Well, I will put my links in here. Uh, I don't know if they're gonna work perfectly, but there they are. Oh, they came out great. There's a bunch of links. Kim, I see you and I can let you unmute. Um, my question is, do you believe somebody can get abstinent without um if they're in if they're a later stage food addict, can they get abstinent without going inpatient treatment or doing your intensive? And I know you say it's Kim. not about the food, but it's the food plan that leads. To, you need a food plan to be to be abstinent. Um, it's my understanding. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kim. Those are both great questions, and um, it, it is about the food. Absolutely, it's about the food in the beginning. Absolutely, we we have to be sober. Um, and so that your question was, do, you know, do you believe a late stage addict can? Um, can get abstinent and in recovery without going to a program. And, and I would say yes, and it's different for everybody. I could not, I was unable to. So it, you'd have to look at your own experience. Have you tried everything and, and have you tried everything and it hasn't worked, then your next step would be some sort of, I believe, um, treatment program. For me, it's like, if I've tried everything and it hasn't worked, I got to go to the next step. I got to get more support. Then I have to get more support. So absolutely. I've seen people, you know, just in the 12 step rooms um, that are late stage addicts and that have had long-term sobriety. Um, and I've seen many, many, many that do need a support like us or some of the other facilities that, that are longer. You know, I, I, I think that if you're late stage and you're still in relapse, it means you need more support. Um, I don't know if it has to be treatment, but it has to be something. So I myself, I didn't go into treatment, but I um, I, I belong to a 12 step group that is very rigorous. Like people are like, that's Nazi, that's like way too much. And to me, it's like, you no, know, it has guardrails that I need. And so I, because I'm willing to do that and I'm willing to put up with the stuff I don't like in it, like sometimes the, 
you know, the people that are a little bit too much on the God stuff. Um, it, it, that's that's my version of treatment. And you, you'll, you'll have to find, I think, whatever it is you find, you, clearly you need more support. And if food, it's three times a day. And in, it, with a food addict, it's multiple times a day. So you need something multiple times a day to be able to say, what do I do now? And and that's treatment does that, but also some 12-step groups do that. Mm -hmm. Or if you I can find say... your own support group, it, but it, it's it's you're not going to find people that have that kind of time. Anyway, go ahead. It's it's so multi. There's so much multi morbidity. Uh, typically, people with eating disorders have complex developmental trauma. Um, I've been sober for over 26 years, and I had to go inpatient for alcohol and drugs, and here I am in the winter of my life. And I, I can't seem to get food sober. Um, it's just, and it's all intertwined, major depressive disorder, ADHD, all of the things. It's so, it's just a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kim, it, it is a lot. And um, I think it's it's about dealing with if addiction is present and still active, in my opinion, that has got to be the disease that's treated primary. And then depending on what happens as we get clean and sober um, with our other um, mental health issues, um, some of them will slowly clear up on their own. Some will not. Um, and then it depends on what we need for support. As long as though that we are using anything addictively, that has to be the primary focus at first. Yeah. I mean, you know, 20 some years ago, they didn't look at your eating when you went inpatient and they passed candy around and AA sponsors minimize sugar and say, oh, you're not going to overdose from, from cake and kill somebody tonight, you know? And it's just, it's, it's, um, yeah, I'm glad that there is, there are all the resources for this now and that you're doing things like this and you have those free meetings and um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. And we need to wrap up for tonight. So thank you, Dr. Tarman and yeah. for coming. Oh yes. Tosca, I really want to say one thing that I, I want, it's been on my mind is, and I think it's, Vera and I are great examples of this, is that we have given a lot of knowledge tonight. Dr. Vera and I both had a, no a lot of knowledge and we were face down in the food. Yeah, exactly. So I just want you to see that this doesn't, it didn't help Vera and I, and this knowledge will not be the thing if you're addicted that will help you. It's great information and it's necessary information, but this is not enough if addiction is present. Not enough, not enough, not enough. We need more support. So I, I really want to say that to people. This isn't like a one and done. Okay, I got all this information. I understand the science. I da, 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 da. That the science is great. It is not the thing that will help you get sober, though. So I just I really want you to hear that. That you're sitting here talking to two people that were in addiction treatment, and we were both face down in the food with a that, head that, full of knowledge, Vera, much more so than I in the, science. The nut, yeah. the nut butter got me even though I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just think it's important. Knowledge is actually not what we need more of for long-term addiction recovery. So thanks, Amanda. Well, thank you to both of you guys. And I am going to stay on and answer um, more questions. And I see that um, there are some questions popping up. So I'm going to stay on and uh, we'll see you guys later. Thank Thanks you so, so much for joining. Thanks so much. Thanks, Vera. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. All right. Well, um, I am willing to still take questions. And for those of you who are watching the recording later, um, I will have all the links that I put in the chat down below the recording and, um, and I'm here for questions. So, um, I did, uh, some of the links that I put in, uh, okay. Yes. I see Kim's got a lot of questions about food and, um, I know we can. So this question says what happens when we're addicted to healthy foods like yogurt, fruits, and nuts. 
um, and still need some some of the food. I mean, there, this is all this is always and Amanda addressed this. Like, what do we do? I've got nutritional needs. I've got medical issues, but food addiction. Well, you know, like Amanda said, we have to treat food addiction ahead of our nutrition, unless we have some sort of major medical thing that we need. We're not following our food plan that we're supposed to follow anyways, because we're food addicts, right? So unless we can actually get stable with our ability to eat on a food plan, then we really can't treat our, our nutritional needs anyways. So we really have to put the addiction treatment above nu nutrition. And what that means a lot of the time is just letting go of some of these nutritional fine tuning things we want to do, just letting them go for a time until we get stable. On our, and a lot of, like we said, a lot of these things resolve because we're, we're not binging anymore. I mean, we are killing ourselves with food. So things do resolve medically and nutritionally when we can stick to a food plan. Um, all right. I see Sharon shared her number. Is the shift meal plan? I don't know what 301 is or gray sheet. Uh, the shift meal plan, the shift food plan, and it's very interesting because people always um, want the food plan that, you know, and there's that diet mentality. Just get me on the food plan. If I can get on the food plan, I'll remember there's two sides of this disease. You've got the physical side and then you've got the mental emotional side. So the food plan will address the physical side, but we won't stay absent if we don't do the deeper treatment. So Shift has a food plan. There's a thousand food plans out there that draw the line for us. And it's important that it's not your food plan that you make up for yourself. Um, and if you get a food plan that's free from your addictive substances and maybe free from things that aren't addictive to you, like, oh, I'm fine with nuts. Okay, but you don't really need them. So you just draw a line in the sand and you stick to that. And, um, and that is that will get you on the path to food neutrality. But you really do need support around that. And we have one thing I want to say about um, something that Shift says. And I see, Melon, you had a question about how do we get the links. If you registered for this course, you're going to have an email. There's going to be a follow-up email with this recording. So there's no worry to that. Um, but one thing I want to mention with um, the support that Shift has is we have four meetings a week called Shift Strong meetings that are totally free and people can come on and just, you know, find a fellowship. We really do need to support each other. And for those of you who have never journeyed into the 12 step world, and let me be clear, Shift Strong meetings are not 12 step meetings. But for those of you who have never journeyed into the 12 step world, there is an incredible amount of support in the 12 step world. And like Dr. Tarvin was saying, we eat so many times a day, we need some support that many times a day. It's out there. We are all supporting each other out there. I have people I can call 24 seven in my, my support network that have helped me stay abstinent over the years. So um, that would be a suggestion, something you can access on shift. That's these free shift strong meetings. Um, I see some questions about Candida, which I don't know anything about. So sorry, I can't help you. I'm not a nutritionist. Um, uh, let's see. I can't really see all of you guys very well. I'm going to switch to gallery mode so I can see more of you. Do, does anyone have any other questions? Sorry, I can't answer the Candida question because I don't know anything about that. Um, but I, all I know is like staying on a, a food plan that's free of my binge foods has helped me in immense ways. Um, and I see a suggestion to just eat meat and low carb veggies. Um, again, if we make up our own food plan, it's not, I, I'll have to tell you, when I came into uh, recovery in my 12 step program, um, I, was I thought that the food plan was stupid. I thought weighing and measuring was stupid, but I still did it, okay? So I, I kept putting my food on the scale one day at a time. And I it took me a couple of weeks to settle into this place where, oh my gosh, I had no idea what being on a food plan was like. I had this imagination of what it would be like, like it's restrictive and I never get to do anything. 
I had no idea that my palate would change, that all my food would taste good, that my food would be the right quantities. And like now my weight has been stable all these years. My food plan stays just the same. My brain is completely at rest about my food. And, you know, my dinner's coming up when I get off of this meeting and I'm not even hungry, but I'll eat it because it's dinner time. But my blood sugar has just been so stable. There's nothing like being on a weight and measured food plan. And when you get to experience the freedom from all the mental obsessions that happen, it's well worth it. Well, well worth it. But um, but the rule of the game is you can't make up your own because if you're making up your own food plan, you don't, you're not going to get any of that. You're going to negotiate um, and, and change the rules. So I just stick to the rules that were given to me. And even though I'm I thought at the beginning, this is stupid. And I have to say, my sponsor made me weigh my milk. Well, this is my surrender story. My sponsor said, no, we don't use a cup for milk. We have to weigh our milk. And I was like, well, that's stupid. A cup is eight ounces. That's so stupid. And um, and uh, I just finally, I somebody told me, well, if she asked you to stand on your head while you weigh the milk, just do it. And I don't know why that just struck. I'm so rebellious, but that just went in. And I was like, oh, I guess I could just actually just do it. And that was the surrender. That re that was my first little surrender. And I recognized that, oh, I don't have to run this show anymore. I can run a lot of shows in my life, but not my food show. I, I have to surrender that. So um, that's my experience with surrendering. I see... Um, Cindy saying, what do you mean? Do you mean food plans that you can buy as well? Um, it's pretty tough to buy foods that are that don't contain any triggering substances in, in this day and age. I don't care what diet plans they're on. They all have that little sweet treat to go with, you know, I don't know what is that a plan to fail kind of job security for these big companies, but they're always keeping us just on the hook with a little bit, little treat at the end of your, no, well, I just eat regular whole foods and it's so simple and it's not hard. And I am the laziest um, eater of all of them. And I sometimes eat canned green beans. I, I, they're just fine for me. I like them. They're, they're a vegetable and um, it's easy. It's so, it's so much easier than being in the food. Um, so I was going to tell a little bit about the shift intensive. If you guys haven't seen, our website is so easy to get to. It's foodaddiction.com. So, and the reason we have the best website out there, foodaddiction.com, is because we've been, this company has been around for over 30 years. And so, um, foodaddiction.com gets you there and there's free consults, 30 minute free consults. I do the bulk of them. So if you want to talk to me for 30 minutes about what to do next, um, get on foodaddiction.com and book a consult with me. This is how we work with people one by one, people coming in, everybody's got, you know, everybody's at their own place in the journey and is a shift intensive right for you? Or is there, you know, a 12 step program that you haven't tried yet? Or, you know, are you doing one kind of food plan and need to do another kind? All these things can be discussed in a consult. And we also have on our website, the Yale Food Addiction Scale. I really encourage you guys to, if, you, if you're not sure, this is for the people who are like, I don't know if I'm a food addict or not. Well, the scientists developed the Yale Food Addiction Scale. It's been used and validated in a bunch of scientific studies, and we have it on our website. I score it. It's a real pain to score. You can get it out there. on. It's open online in a, in a PDF form, but it's a real pain to score. So I'll score it for you. It's just clicky clicky, and I'll let you know your score can be very helpful to let you know what you're dealing with because some people, you can see those early stage food addicts that can slide up and down the slippery slope. And you're like, why can't I do that? Like I just have, I just wanna have little bites and licks or I wanna have my sweeteners and yet you keep falling in the ditch. Well, maybe you're not an early stage food addict. Maybe you are a severe food addict and you can see that on the Yale food addiction scale. You can see what kind of food addict you are. Um, I also want to throw out our next intensive is in March, March 14th through 21. It's gotten longer, eight days now, and there's an 11 week aftercare. So we literally are with you for 12 weeks. 
and we work the whole steps therapeutically. It's not the same 12 steps if you've done it before. I mean, it's the same 12 steps, but it's a much deeper therapeutic uh, application of the 12 steps. And, um, you know, we get you plugged in with sponsors into the 12 step world. It's the full, it's the most comprehensive treatment available out there for food addiction right now. It's not an, you know, it's not an online course or support coach. It's like the full group processing. Um, and you might, and I saw some people that I, I know on here testifying that the shift intensive made a huge difference for, for them. I've been with shift for a year and I've gotten to play client at a couple of shift intensives and it has been hugely impactful to me. And I, I was absent coming into it. Um, but the deep emotional work that needs to be done is incredible at these shift intensives. Um, so you are welcome to check that out. And I want to say that for the first time, we are going to have an intensive in May in the UK. So I'm really excited. I hope I get to go to the UK. I think I will. And um, we're doing an intensive over there. And that that's going to come right after the... Um, the food addiction conference that they have out in London in May, May 17th, I think. So that's really exciting for us. Um, you guys are all, we're, are we down to not that many people? Oh no, we still have quite a few. But if anyone has questions, you could raise your hand and I would happily answer your questions or we can wrap it up. Yes. Kim. Oh, I'm going to let you unmute. I can't see you. And there you go. Hi, it's me again. Hi. I just, I'm curious about, at, so at the intensives, do you have psychiatrists, psychotherapists, do you have a team that treats each in individual? Like if, if you're quadruply diagnosed with an eating disorder and food addiction do you have like what does your treatment team look like yeah well amanda is our lead therapist and um yes there's always two therapists at a, an, an event but it's not um we don't do a lot of individual treatment this is group therapy so you would be in group the whole time um you know, it, it would be worth a consult probably with me to talk about if this is a good fit or not. But yes, you know, most, not most, but there's a huge overlap between eating disorders and food addiction, right? And so you go to an eating disorder treatment to get, um, you know, to get treatment. And then they, they're not, you know, they're having you eat things in moderation that you trigger you because you're a food addict. So you're not actually getting the physical part of the treatment at those. So you can't really get served by an eating disorder treatment place if they don't acknowledge food addiction. Food addiction, right. food substance use disorder. Right, and so for us, we do, you know, because there's such an overlap, I mean, we're treating the primary diseases, food addiction, and yes, emotional eating plays a part in that, and I don't know what form your eating disorder takes, but what we see, again, with most of us is if we have addiction, that is the primary thing we have to work on, and then um, once we've worked on that it just like the rest of things just kind of naturally start to resolve when we focus on that um so that was a great question and i think that are you strictly treating um food addiction you don't have alcohol uh, people getting sober from alcohol so addiction is addiction is addiction right so okay. uh, and like we said there's a lot of ways that things can cross addiction or you know whack-a-mole of course we are not like there's no medical presence and so if someone needs to detox from some sort of substance that is you know requires medical attention we are not doing that um we okay. have many many people who have been alcoholics but are sober but are in the food i mean it's just there's many, many people that are multiple addicted to multiple substances. And it's, it's all, remember, we're treating the same thing. Like we got to get down right. to the core, which is our addiction, which is our restless, irritable discontent. And it pops out in all these ways. So we're sure, but there's a different level of care for a meth addict or a heroin addict. And I think 
we would have to see if they were a suitable fit and that would be something that I'm not um, in the position to judge. That would be more something that for Amanda to, to look at, of course. So yeah, you know, book a consult mm -hmm. and we can talk about it and see if we're a good fit for you. And there's Thank also, I, I will throw out, there's also, there is a couple of eating disorder treatment places that do recognize food addiction. Um, one of them is um, Milestones in Florida. And uh, you can use an abstinent food plan with them. So that's something you can check out for a longer term care um, and that your health insurance might cover. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Wendy, I will let you unmute. I just wanted to know when the next virtual intensive is. I know there was one in January, but I was interested in knowing that just to know. Yeah, and so people might not know that we do virtual intensives. Um, we started them in uh, COVID times because COVID absolutely shut us down. And so we were like, well, might as well try it virtually. And um, it's, you know, but people were kind of like, eh, I don't know if this is gonna work. It totally worked. It totally worked. People at home on Zoom like this all day in group processing with each other on Zoom it worked. So we kept a couple of, uh, we do a couple a year. We just did one in January. And um, I think the next one is in July. Um, July? So, yep. Yep. So the very next opportunity would be um, in person in Florida in March. And then after that, it, it's uh, the UK in May and then the July one. So we don't have them constantly. Um, we have, they pop up every couple of months and we do lots of extensive um, programming after the intensive. So like we have our continued alumni support. We have courses called like emotional sobriety, breaking free from codependency, um, uh, the practice, which is steps 10, 11, and 12. We keep working because like Amanda and Dr. Tarman said, we have to keep in our recovery. We have to keep working. We don't just get to rest, not when we're addicts. We don't, because if I, if, if I hold still, I'm sliding backwards. So I need to do something every day. And I just have accepted that. And that's why I get to live in contented abstinence, contented sobriety, because I've accepted that I'm an addict. And this is like, this comes to, down to like grief. Sometimes I talk a lot about grief and there's, there's, processes to grief and for a lot of us we've lived in denial for a long 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 time and then we can get angry we can be bargaining we can be sad um but what we want to get to is acceptance and I'm so grateful that I just feel fully accepting of my disability disease um condition I know I need a food plan as my structure for my eating and I'm I'm not fighting against it in my mind and I know I need to do certain things for my emotional sobriety. Beautiful things like prayer and meditation, um, you know, meetings and talking to people. There's a lot of people on here, faces I'm seeing that are friendly faces and uh, love, love you guys. And uh, it's, we support each other. It's an, it's actually amazing. It's a gift to, um, to be in fellowship with each other. It's a real gift. And we get extremely close to people because you get, you know, like you get me and I get you because we share this common um, condition. It's beautiful. So, all right. Any, anybody else have last questions? I will, I would take your hand. If you can raise your hand, I'll take a question or we can wrap it up. People are dropping off like flies. It's about it's about that time. It's bedtime on the East Coast, I know. So it's dinner time over here. I'm in Colorado. So all right, everyone. Thank you so, so much for coming. It was a beautiful turnout. And um, we'll send you that recording link. And check in the description down below the recording link. And you can find all the other links that you want. Um, Dr. Tarman's uh, Facebook group is a great resource and there's um, and her book and the Food Junkies podcast is a great resource. So please check those out. And we are here for you. You do not need to be on this journey alone. In fact, you really you you really need to not be alone on this journey. So don't be alone. Join us. OK, we're here. This is what we do. You are one of us. 
we're together. So join us and thank you all. Good night.